How's it going, everybody? So uh, I'm here with Kevin, and I'm kind of excited to do this. This is the first uh, live stream I've ever done with Kevin. And uh, we had talked about doing this a couple of weeks ago because we both got big news. And uh, right. you know, how, how's your day going, Kevin? My day's going great, Mike. Good to, good to be on with you. On a side note, what's the weather like over there right now? Uh, pretty hot. Not quite as bad as you, but uh, we're, we're running like 96 degrees, I think. 96. That's yeah. That sounds like paradise right now here. Really? What? Where are you at? 105 or? I think 115, 116. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. Last I look, you know. But once it gets over like 110, it just feels like, you know, feels like an oven. So you, you, your body can't really tell too much after that. Yeah, I think you're right. (laughs) Okay, so, uh, why don't you just tell everybody, Kevin? Well, cool. okay. I, I guess the first bit of news is that uh, you are becoming my uh, my exclusive international distributor. And uh, this came up. It was kind of funny because my wife uh, had been saying to me about two weeks before we had the discussion, uh, you know, I just have this feeling that something's got to give here because you're spending every minute that you're not cutting records, shipping Kirsten's records. And uh, and we got a garage with two pallets of records in it. And what do we do when we get another title? And I went, that's a good question. And well, we'll worry about it when we get there. And she goes, no, I think you really should start worrying about it now. <laughs> and and then you called up w- with the offer. And um, it was like, yeah, this is an answer to a prayer. So I'll tell you how I came up with it. And this is something I hope to be able to address in this partnership. So I was at Expona and... I was going from room to room to room and I was listening to the same three records, which were sonically spectacular, but typical hi-fi show, the most boring music ever. And I just thought to myself, well, that Kirsten's record would be so fantastic in these rooms. And from room to room to room, nobody had it. Nobody had it in the floor downstairs. It just wasn't there. I thought to myself, there needs to be this. This would have been a perfect record for this show. Right. And I got home and I thought to myself, I think we had talked, and I think you said something along the lines as well that you were at a hi fi show and nobody had it there as well. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gave me the idea to approach you. And because I thought to myself, I'm like, this really should be in more people's hands. You know, uh-huh. I think of things in terms as a brick and mortar store. I do a lot of online business and that's majority of where our business is. But I think in terms of a, nor, you know, a, a local store and so many great records are discovered at the store level. So I kind of got the sure. idea. Let me approach Gavin and let, let me mention it to him. But my goal during all of this is to try to get this in the hands of many record stores, something that you really were never capable of doing. You know, no. you, you don't have the schedule to where you could be shipping out three records over here and four records over here Mm -hmm. times a couple of hundred. So that is my goal with this is I really would like to get this not only in the hands, obviously nothing changes as far as where you're able to buy it. You know, you're right. Right. The the big, the big three will be buying from you instead of me shipping directly to them. So everybody is still going to be able to get it from where they got it in the past. You know, the cursing records, but my goal is to be able to try to get this not only there, but in the hands of smaller stores and more make it more accessible to the smaller retail, something again, like you weren't able to do, but it's very easy. So I'm, you know, encouraging those stores to contact me. And I, you know, I talk to a decent amount of stores and I'll reach out to them myself, but you know, I want to get that in their hands. So we have Kirsten's record is scheduled for, what is it? The third pressing at this point? Uh, this is um, the fourth. The fourth pressing. So that I'll actually yeah. probably, I think we're on pace for the end of the month. Yes, uh, that's what it well, looks bar- like. Barring any issues. and keep Right. In mind, guys, it's in the queue at RTI. They've got, ja- I had to press, I had to print another 2,500 jackets and, um, and, and inserts and label, you know, sets of labels. And uh, it's all at RTI and they confirm that it's in the queue. Um, and that usually to me means two to three weeks. Fantastic. And it's a pretty short ride here. You know, we're 
six hour, seven hour truck ride over. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's perfect. It, it's just everything about this deal. I, I'm, I'm very excited about Mike. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And a lot of guys watching know, you know, I attempted myself to put out a record and I did, but as fun as it was being a one man show in Arizona, that's geared towards selling, buying and selling records. It was out of my wheelhouse. I did it. I, not to pat myself on the back, I feel like I did a great job doing it, but it was not my f most favorite experience. Right. So this is perfect because I I get a little bit of that without doing anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. It's a well, you know, of... I, I, the very first thing I should have said even before we launched into our announcement is is that I really appreciate what you did for the record. Um, you're so, some people said you're you're. YouTube was a little over the top. What the heck? I mean, you obviously had a love of the record. Uh, it showed. And uh, I think that translated into sales. It, it generated a lot of excitement. And uh, I really appreciate it. And, and, and you showed that excitement from the very beginning when I told you what I was doing before you'd even heard it. You know, it's if I had the know how, if I had your know how, you're doing exactly what I would want to do. So cool. for me, it was amazing right from the jump because if somebody said mike here's infinite amount of money you can do this you if i knew exactly everything you knew and i can make what you make and record what you record that would be my dream job to be able to record direct to two track all analog small jazz bands i would just it's it's heaven for me i, I would it's, love to do it so it's pretty damn fun i got to admit it <laughs> yeah it's, I, I, this has been the most incredible year i mean i can't even almost believe it looking back at it it's just been amazing yeah I, it, it truly is fantastic and i mean the second title what are we thinking towards the end of the year hopefully hopefully um okay so it's it's an anthony wilson record i mean it's kind of mm -hmm. out there but you know might as well explain it again it's an anthony wilson jazz guitarist um for those who don't know he's diana crawl's guitarist and has been since uh since the paris recordings mm -hmm. uh back in early 2000s or 2001, whenever that was. And uh, the rest of the band is basically the small group that she plays with. It's uh, it's um, Jeff Hamilton on drums and uh, John Clayton um, on, on bass. And then his son, Gerald, who is also on Kirsten's record, is the pianist on this record. Obviously, he doesn't play with Diana because Diana is the, the pianist in, in that band. So, um, but, but he's a busy guy in his own right. And, it, you know, one of the things that held up getting Kirsten's record recorded was waiting for Gerald to get off of tour so that we could get him in the studio because, uh, I think he came back from recording in, or not recording, but performing in Europe with Charles Lloyd, like four days before we did Kirsten's record. So, um, uh, that was pretty incredible. And, and we got him again on this one and he and Anthony play together all the time. They're both in Charles Lloyd's, one of Charles Lloyd's trios that he plays with. And, uh, as a matter of fact, I saw them live for, uh, Charles 85th birthday concert at the Soraya here in, uh, yeah. in Northridge. So, yeah, so we, we got an all-star band for this and they are very excited about the recording. Um, they, they've been put some stuff up on, uh, on their Instagrams and, uh, it was really fun. I'm excited too. You know, uh, it really, this band really is kind of some of the best guys that play jazz today. So, I mean, it's, it's true. And what's kind of cool. It's, this isn't something that you would typically see. You wouldn't see a top tier cast of musicians go to, you know, you're a small label at this point in time. Exactly. So, with a small studio. <laughs> yeah. But so that's such a cool, but I think, what you're doing is selling itself and I'm excited for the future and what it holds because what you're providing is such, you know, it's an experience that musicians just can't get elsewhere. Yeah. A, I, I can't tip my hand yet, but we're talking to two or three other groups of jazz musicians in the same category. And um, it, we're really excited. We're really I think excited. it's definitely going to, I think, take a life of its own as word gets out as a catalog of records gets out mm -hmm. well what was what was amazing was the response to some of the people's uh you know jeff hamilton posted on instagram and uh and joe harley did because joe was actually the producer for this record 
And uh, and the response was amazing from L.A. studio cats, you know, saying, oh. hey, that sounds really cool. You know, tell us about this studio. So. So let me ask you this. Do you have kind of a target amount of titles you would like to achieve in a year? I mean, for the present time, I really can't see doing more than a couple. Yeah. But, you know, eventually I'd like to get to the point where I can be doing maybe three or four. Busy mastering schedule. What did you do? 400 records last year? 385, I think, is what I counted. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to be up pretty close to that this year. I, I've actually turned away business. It's just it was getting a little bit too much, especially with trying to run the label, too. I can't I can't really continue doing 400 albums a year and do a record, you know, a couple of records, too. Yeah. So I do a new arrival video every Thursday talking about what's come out every week. And I think at this point in time, the three most common words at, on my new arrival video are uh, Neil Young. King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard and Kevin Gray. There <laughs> seems to be a release by the three of you, if not every week, surely every couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, between what I'm doing for the two different uh, Blue Note series and what I'm doing for Concord Craft, I mean, that's a heck of a lot of jazz right there. Oh, yeah. I mean, it. I would think, you know, you have Bernie's doing the contemporary stuff and Ryan's doing some of the impulse stuff, but the three of you and are, Verve. yeah, he's doing Verve too. Stuff, but the three of you are definitely putting out the bulk of the, of the jazz records these days. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah. A huge percentage. And, uh, you took on the Rhino project. Right. Right. I mean, that's another, that's, that's only two records per, uh, is it per quarter? I think that they're doing so. That's not going to really tax me much. And I love the stuff. I can't talk about it yet, but we, they've got some great new titles coming out. Everybody's going to be pretty jazzed, if you'll excuse the fun. <laughs> I think when I saw they originally announced, you know, a couple of titles a quarter, I have a feeling that that'll get picked up. Good. Uh, it I could. think it's going to be a real successful series. I think they were probably relatively happy. Cars sold out pretty quick. So I feel like yeah. that's something that, my gut is telling me that it'll do really well. They're going to sell tons of them, and I think they'll end up trying to pick up demand. You know, they'll speed up the release schedule. We'll see. Well, you say tons of them. They're supposedly only doing 5,000, but I have a feeling that's going to change too. I, I can't see that being sustainable. I think yeah. this was – this first release, they'll kind of work out some of the kinks, some of the shipping issues. And when I say I, I think, I mean, that's just my opinion. I yeah. don't have any inside information there. I have no idea. It just seems to me it would make sense to press, you know, not make it a limited run. But Absolutely. That Cars record was, I think the acclaim on that was pretty universal. I, you did a fantastic job on that. And Thank there's you. a lot of people asking me, like, you know, how can I get it? Well, <laughs> this guy. I love, I love that record, too. So that was just a blast to do that one. That and was, you know, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. I think that was, well, I mastered that before they had announced the series. So I didn't know that was going to be a part. I thought I was just doing another Rhino title, you know? Mm -hmm. So I didn't do anything special for it, but I love the record. So, you know, I gave it my all. That was uh, one of, I think, I, I always have fond memories of my first record club. I think, what was it 13 for a penny? <laughs> yeah. And that was one of those initial 13. Uh, okay. So I always have fond memories, you know, of those original 13 because they were, you know, the 13 CDs that I owned for about two years, you know, I didn't have uh -huh. the money, you know, didn't have enough to get, uh, get any more of those. I think my father found out about it and put the kibosh on that monthly CD coming. Uh oh. I think he wrote him and told him something along the lines, you know, you, uh, you're signing up contracts with an 11 year old. <laughs> so after I was done being punished, I still had those 13 CDs and I remember them very fondly, but that was one of them. So definitely a fantastic record and one that I'm really partial to even to today. Yeah. Well, thanks. So, thanks for the accolades. I appreciate it. So, you think we're still on target? At target for the end of the year? Well, here's the problem. In, in a nutshell, I'm dealing with an artist who's like touring all summer, yeah. uh, Anthony Wilson, and uh, I mean, they they literally took off the day after our session and flew up to Canada to start the tour with with mm -hmm. Diana Krall in Canada. So um, he. I, I took I took the analog tape and went back to digital rather than just putting out the digital file that I had run simultaneously to the analog because I wanted to hear I wanted him to hear the way it, you know it's close to without playing vinyl 
yeah. you know, as, as it really sounds. So I, I made up digital files. I sent them to Joe. He was thrilled. I sent them to, uh, to Anthony. And I think it was a week before he even got a chance to hear it. And the thing that was so cool about it is they have a tour bus with a pretty decent sound system. And he started playing it on the tour bus. Wow. And everybody was freaking out. It's like, what is this recording, man? This is so cool. So, you know, that was, that was very fun to hear. And so be, I've stayed out of the loop, but he and Joe, I think have decided the tunes they're using and they're still debating on the takes as I understand it. So, uh, cause we recorded, I think we recorded nine tracks in two days and we'll probably have room for six on the record. It mm -hmm. looks like this one's going to be three per side because yeah. the songs are all a little on the longer side. And there's one track, one track, it's a 10 minute ballad, but this thing is just gorgeous. I mean, it knocked Joe and I off our feet. It was so good. So that's going to go on the record somewhere. And uh, so anyway, you know, we've got extra material. So they've got a kind of, and, and I think we did, uh, there's only two of the nine tracks that we did in one take. Um, we did two takes, I think, on most of them and three on a couple. So, you know, he's got to decide which takes he likes best. And we did have a photographer come who hung out for the session. Uh, his name is Brian Bixby. You can go to his uh, Instagram and see some of the photos that he took from the session. And um, so he and and uh, Anthony are you know going back and forth over pictures and stuff. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can get a design in the works. And once we've got the the, the actual uh, sequence and timing late, you know nailed down, then we can do labels and we can do the jackets. And but, it seems like that stuff has kind of improved. I mean, am I right on that as far as? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lead times the time. are, are a lot less than they were. Yeah, for both. Yeah. The pressing and the, and the jackets. Fantastic. So, yeah, we couldn't have hit it at a worse time for getting jackets done. Yeah. Very exciting. Now, let me ask you this. It seems like you've kind of based this as, uh, and rightly so, an analog vinyl label. Have you mm -hmm. given any thought to SACDs, digital screaming i mean i get asked yeah we're going we're going to make it available through cobuzz for both mm -hmm. streaming and download but here's the deal i want to keep it high res I, yeah. I i put so much work into the sound on this thing to get the thing squashed down to you know mp3 would literally kill me <laughs> i couldn't oh. stand to listen to it and so would, and you know so i don't think detrimental to the music i mean it wouldn't be like not listening to the same album that yeah. record deserves yeah, I, high res treatment right so but but cobuzz uh you know the the native resolution we're doing is 24 176 and um you know and, and i've heard the files you know at that resolution and they sound amazing so yeah so we're, we're going to put it up on cobuzz so i wanted to let sales i wanted to let sales kind of plateau a bit before i did that yeah. I didn't want to detract from record sales. Everybody tells me it's two different markets, but you know, I was still slightly superstitious about it, I guess. So, um, I mean, maybe the bulk of it is two separate markets, but I see a lot of people who kind of do a little bit of SACD vinyl and high res. So there's definitely right. a crossover. So keep, yeah, I, I gotta be honest. I, I know I'm, I'm, uh, in disagreement with the pack on this, but I'm not a big fan of SACD. I don't really care for the sound of DSD 64. Okay. When you get up to 256, that's an amazing sound, but the files are unbelievably large. Yeah. And, not uh, like yeah. So the, nobody's doing that. I don't think for streaming yet, but uh, yeah, I'm not that hot on SACDs or putting it out. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to bother putting out CDs on it. Um, I, I've heard what 1644 one does to it. And uh, you know, I don't want to say it destroys it, but it does take away some of the, breadth and width and and you know mm -hmm. detail one of the things i get asked about too in the store a lot is have you thought about any kind of special treatment with any of these records special vinyl formulation higher 45 rpm anything of that nature ever been something well i'm also you know I, again i'm i'm not probably in agreement with the pack but i i don't like 45 rpm i mean it sounds great no no question about it it sounds a little better than 33 but having to flip the record over, you know, two, three times, whatever it is, you know, to play it on 45 on four sides, to me, it's just a pain in the ass. I'm not a big fan of 45s. It is. So, yeah. I mean, that's just, that's just me, you know? Yeah. No, I, it's not just you. It's a lot of people. 
Okay. Well, it's my record company, so that's what I'm Yeah, no, but there's a lot of people. No, no, I mean, there's a lot of people who are not a fan of the 45s for that reason. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just Um, you in the sense that a lot of people prefer 33. It has a more more natural flow. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, you know, I'm kind of telling tales out of school, but, you know, Ron Rambach never wanted to do 45s, you know, on on Music Matters in the first place. He felt like he Mm -hmm. got pushed into it because – that's kind of where the industry, the audiophile industry was at that point in time. Yeah. And when he heard all of the changes that I made to my system in, in 2012, he was like, and we did it. We did a test. I cut him an acetate of, of one that we had done at 45 at, at 33. And he went, wow, I can't see any point in, in beating my head against the wall doing 45s. So that was <laughs> when I, that I, ended. No. And I think that's the census too, at this point, the love for the music matters 33 stuff is off the chart and compared to the 45 i think people you know and obviously you've had system changes and things have changed I did. there were some serious improvements in there but i think at this point in time i think the consensus is that the 33s are sonically superior at this point they really do that was the conclusion that joe and, and ron and i came to it uh what a label and it was very sad when that kind of dried up i know i i was a little bit disappointed uh, you know, there was like a one last hurrah with, uh, I remember it was like a Christmas, maybe 2019, 2020. There was an, a little box set, but fantastic that the tone poets have kind of taken over. And it right. seems like we have a nice solid pipeline There's of tone poets left. So very, and reasonably priced. It's right. It's, I know a lot of people in the beginning kind of would say, you know, 40 bucks for a record, but it seems like that has kind of changed to where at 38 99 retail, people really feel like they're getting a value for. Yeah. That well, and the, you know, the photos and everything, you know, I, I know music matters started all of that, but the, the photos, uh, it's just great. I mean, Francis Wolf's photography is iconic yeah. and it truly to be able is. to put the session photos on there. I think that's just the coolest. It truly is an alt the ultimate package, and really something you kind of modeled the curse. Yeah, oh, absolutely! I, I'm the first to admit it. You know, you know, I I, I won't call that a coincidence. <laughs> no, but I, it, of course, I mean, I couldn't think of anything you could do to actually make it any better. So, if you really were trying to make the very best possible, that would be the formula you would use. Yeah, but the, as far as vinyl, I mean, I'm very very happy with the vinyl that that we're using. You know, which is the RTI. HQ 180 vinyl, whatever, you know, I think it's, well, I probably shouldn't say, but I, you know, it's, it's, um, well, I'll say it. It's TPC, you know, uh, Thai Plastics Corp, their vinyl. And, um, you know, it's one of the very, very best vinyls available. I tell you from my experience. So I offer a service on the website to where I will open records, ultrasonically clean them if, check for any kind of warps if I need to flatten something or if it's damaged, right. I swap it out. But right. I can tell you that leads me to opening thousands and thousands and thousands of records. And that particular release, the Tone Poet releases, the Kirsten release, the vinyl defects, I mean, they're there with every pressing plant, but they are of course. extremely low and as close to zero as you're going to get. I mean, it, it is truly amazing how how those records come out they're they're clean they're quiet they're not filthy right. they're not dirty they're not warped and they don't play with a load of surface noise yep <laughs> yeah and no, uh it, it was um <laughs> it was uh an amazing experience to put uh, you know it started with the test pressing when i got the first test pressing from rti on kirsten's record and put it on and i just kind of went wow I, I i've hit a mark i've hit a mark that i was trying to get to for a long, long time. Very cool. What, what an experience. So here's a question from the audience, and I kind of want to pivot it to some of these, especially. Sure. Related. Have you given any thoughts to doing anything on the uh, VR900? Leland wants to know. What is the VR900? Is that That's a vinyl? Kind of the RTI super vinyl. Uh, oh. A little bit quieter, I would say, as a whole. You think? I'm not uh, familiar with it. I don't know about it. Uh, I can talk to them about it. Music oh, yeah, Leland. I, I know Leland. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Leland. <laughs> music, yeah, I will, um, SRX. music Matters did SRX on it. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll check it out. 
I'll check it out. It depends on what it adds to the cost, you know, because like I say, I'm kind of kind of at that sweet spot. And if I get much over that, I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah, I think it's kind of from what I've heard in the industry, it's definitely significantly more expensive. Ed. The def the reject rate is quite a bit higher. OK, so I think it would definitely necessitate a price increase. And I don't know if that's really. That's not I don't really think necessary. that's where I want to go yet. Maybe maybe a couple of releases down the road. Yeah, maybe as an option or something. But I never listened to the Kirsten record and thought to myself, you know, this could really use from you know, use quieter vinyl. So I don't know no, if that's something that's popped I think it sounds pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty damn quiet. Uh, you know, I ultrasonically clean my records. Maybe I've yeah. got a slanted viewpoint on that because of that. But it is about as quiet as you're going to get. Because one of the things I think your recording has that even really clean, quiet vinyl from the 50s and 60s, you have a lower noise floor. Oh, yeah. On your recording itself. Oh, yeah. That so too. That kind of helps with the overall surface sound, I feel. I mean, uh -huh. it just seems like an extremely quiet record. And that's kind of... Well, modern modern recording tape is so much quieter than than Scotch 111 and 201 that everybody was using back in the 50s and 60s. So how does that work? I mean, can you print to it at like a higher uh, when you're recording oh, yeah. tape? Yeah, I, I I I my operating level is 5 dB over 185 nanowebers, which was zero VU yeah. forever. You know, I mean, going back to the 40s and 50s. So I'm recording 5 dB hotter. And the, and the tape still has like 15 dB of headroom over, you know, what what the original tape had. So you can print to it hotter. You so you can you can record hotter, and then you've automatically got a lower noise floor. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have print through issues. It doesn't have a lot of the problems that that a lot of the older tapes had. And we're not having issues with tape these days. I mean, at this point, anyways. No, I've I've had. No problems. Knock on wood. <laughs> no, uh, no sticky shed. Nothing like that. Hopefully. Well, that that takes a while to show up. I mean, who knows what it's going to do in ten or fifteen years? But um, yeah, you know, sticky shed didn't start to show up until like the mid '80s, and that was for tapes that were released like in '74. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, it takes a good solid decade before that starts rearing its ugly head. But you know, the European tapes have been so much better. I, I haven't had many issues at all with Bassif or Agfa, which are basically the parent to, to uh, the uh, RMG. Well, it, it was, it went from Bassif to RMG to MTech and now it's uh, RTM recording the masters. And, but the model number stayed the same all the way along. It's called SM 900. I mean, and that was mostly an Ampex issue. Was it not? I mean, that's, it was, it was. Yeah. yeah Cause Scotch 250 wasn't a problem either. Uh, although they did have one bad tape called Scotch 226 that shed like crazy but um yeah it was it was mostly an ampex problem yes yeah very cool let me see take a look at some of the questions you know and actually i had a bizarre question nothing sure. to do with it, but i thought about it so you broke the news on the uh war's greatest hits a yeah. couple of streams and that sent from a record store perspective that kind of sent everybody into a tizzy and yes. it shot the record up through the roof so it's kind of interesting to see how that played out have you ever have you ever Two, two questions here. Have you ever recorded something and was, or not recorded, excuse me, have you ever mastered something and was just blown away by the results? I mean, maybe it was something that you didn't anticipate coming out the way it did, or maybe it was something musically, something you weren't familiar with that kind of, you just kind of had that wow moment. I can think of two off the top of my head. Uh, Dark Side of the Moon that I did with Doug Sachs for the, uh, the 30th anniversary, you know, back in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, I was so thrilled with the way that vinyl sounded on that. Now, the first pressings that I've got, and I think we discussed this on the phone one time, yeah. were the ones that were done by RTI, which did not actually do the, the release pressings. Those were all done by Palace in Germany. But because all the metalwork was done at RTI, they did a test pressing just so we could confirm that the metalwork was good mm -hmm. before they sent everything off to Palace. And um, I was knocked out by that. The other one, I don't know if you're familiar with this project or not, because it, it was limited to 500. Uh, it was the box set that I did for the San Francisco Symphony for the Mahler symphonies. 
Yes. Um, a few of those went out to record stores, but they wanted the whole thing pre-sold before we mastered it even. And the Eighth Symphony, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's it's an oversized orchestra with <laughs> chorus and pipe organ, you know? And the final movement of that thing, I've said this before, but it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck when I played it back on the vinyl. I was just so pleased that it sounded so good on record. So... Yeah, those are the two that I can think of off the top of my head. In addition to the war thing, I was I was excited about that too. I've had that uh, that box set on my want list for quite some time. I've heard you talk about it in the past, so it's not getting any easier to acquire. That <laughs> Sorry about that. That particular box set, but I was really fascinated when I did hear you talk about the war and kind of how you passed it back and forth with Joe, and you guys were like, "Wow, listen to this," and you know that. That was kind of a, for me, that was kind of a cool story. You know, I think a yeah, lot of people. He, he played it for Fremer when Fremer came out and Fremer just like fell over. He was so excited about it. So L tell me a little bit about that uh, dark side experience, because that was something that a lot of people don't realize they were going to do in the late 90s. They were going to do yes. a reissue of that. And that kind of got scrapped. You ended up doing that with. Doug, Doug Sack was involved. Was it just the two of you from what I remember? Were other No, there were a couple of other people in on it too. Arnie Acosta, who had worked for Doug, came mm -hmm. up and uh Tom Pisano, who was their their maintenance, you know, electronics maintenance tech. And um Joel, I can't remember his last name, but he is with the Pink Floyd team, the current yeah. Pink Floyd team. And so yeah, we had a bunch of people in the room when we did that. And it literally took three of us to cut it. I operated the lathe. Doug operated, uh, you know, made the level changes. And uh, Arnie did the EQ changes because um, it was all done in real time and with just one set of everything. There was no switchable stuff like I normally have in my system. So, um, yeah, it was it was a collaborative effort, effort. We used my cutting electronics. We bypassed my console. We used his tape machine. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Yeah. So what was, was his tape machine? Do you remember? Yeah. Well, it's it's a highly well, I don't even want to say it's highly modified. It's an MCI transport, but with custom, totally custom tube electronics. For just that the MCI was, yeah. Yeah. It was an MCI deck, but, Very cool. but it was all, all tube electronics. What was the reason for that choice? Do you remember? Well, that's no, that, that's Doug's pet machine that he just absolutely loves. Um, I think they, it might have even been the same electronics that they put in their Ampex 200 when they first started, because I think very quickly after they put the Ampex 200 in, they designed newer tube electronics for it. And I mm -hmm. think they used those all the way along. So and the story about the reason I got involved was because Doug, wisely or unwisely, had decided to pull out his analog disc cutting rig when um, when they opened up in Ojai. So um, so at that time, he was not cutting anything. He was only was doing digital kind of that was actually right. going to be my next question. How did you come into that? From That's how I came. I got a call from Doug Sachs one day and he goes, hey, you want to master Dark Side of the Moon? And I went, whoa, really? What's the story? And he explained it. And I said, yeah, count me in. <laughs> You're like, Absolutely. Sign me up. Yeah, for we that. had a fun, a fun time. I, I, I was such a fan of Doug Sachs. I, I've, I've always been really enamored with his work. And uh, so getting to collaborate with him on something was was really fun, really amazing. That was a really weird record. So I remember when that came out, it was talked about, but the buzz was never, I don't think I'm going back 20 years now. I don't remember in the audiophile community, the buzz being huge on that record. And I remember I did a shootout on that record. And I thought at the time, like this thing is so undervalued. This record is so amazing. And it seems like in the last five to six years, people have kind of gotten wise to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been a, a huge fond appreciation for it. And that's obviously, you know, you can tell by the prices, but that's right. Seems well, that was another one that I dropped in a podcast when I mentioned that there were RTI test pressings of that floating oh, around, yeah. you know, I, I heard I one of those went for three or 400 bucks or something or more. I don't know. Well, I got one myself and what did I pay? I think I paid three grand for mine. Three grand? Three thousand dollars. But wow. How, but you know, it's so rare. How do you argue with the price? If there's yeah. maybe they what do they maybe do ten of them, maybe twenty of them? You know, yeah, something, yeah, that's about right. It's not like <laughs> you can 
argue with the price too much. You know, I've found in a lot of guys who have been heavy record collectors, you kind of pay what it somebody demands, or you maybe wait another 10 years for one to pop up. And I just right. didn't want to wait another 10 years. So, but I remember in general, <clears throat> that was talked about. That RTI test pricing was talked about years ago. Mm-hmm. And versus the European pressing, where was it done at Palace or Optimal? Press the thirty. Palace. 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 Did Did you ever know uh, Richard Foster? No. He had a thing called the Phonogram website, mm-hmm. and uh, he did reviews of records. He, he's a Canadian guy. He passed away a few years ago, but he raved about. It. He said it was the the best version. He, he compared like five of them. Said it blew all the others away, and you know he was, yeah, he was very ecstatic about it it's definitely an unbelievable record how it was done and i know people have been kind of clamoring it they were hoping that there would be a more accessible version of that you know because that mm-hmm. 30th now that's a 300 hundred dollar record okay that anniversary so there's been a lot of talk a lot of people you know hoping that something like that can be done again but it is weird going back and if you've been doing this a while to see how kind of when it came out it was You know, it kind of, I remember when I opened the store in 2015, you could actually still get the 30th new and then you could get, I think Doug Sachs mastered another version maybe after that. Uh, Yeah, that was from digital though. Yeah, around 2011. But there was a point in time where you could get both of them. Uh It's definitely interesting to see how the industry has changed as a whole and uh, the progression of it has been fun to watch for me anyways. Very true. You know, uh, let me see here. So Angelo Kelly, part of the Kelly family, asks, would you ever considering recording a Ron Carter record? Oh, absolutely. No, yeah, I'd say, right? it, no I'd, I'm, I'm afraid I'd have to say no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, Ron, just, we're not quite. I, I, I just Cal- saw him in New York. I just saw him in New York at Smoke Jazz. Uh, he's 86. And he just did one hell of a show with with a quartet. Uh, but what was really fun is he did a solo version of "You Are My Sunshine," not "Sunshine of My Life," but "You Are My Sunshine." Yeah. You know, and and yeah. he did this like ten minute version of it that was just incredible. My wife and I kept looking at each other and grinning. It was really fun. Your wife a jazz fan? She has become one. I think I've turned her into one, you know. <laughs> but, now, do you have any recommendations for me? How does one turn their wife to a jazz fan? I, I just play it a lot. and she's I'm having kinda, difficulty here myself. Yeah, she's accepted it. Uh, we, we have two stations that are non-commercial in Los Angeles. Uh, one is K-Jazz, the jazz station, mm-hmm. and the other is KUSC, which is classical. And uh, so I either have one or the other playing in the house most of the time, you know, yeah. when I'm off work and just relaxing. So she, she gets a pretty good dose of, uh, of jazz. Oh, and that brings up a funny story that I, I have said this before, but I'll say it again. I'm listening to K jazz. I don't know this a few months ago and they play this record and it's like, wow, I got to listen through to find out what this is. And then the announcer comes on and he said, that's uh, Anthony Wilson's record. Um, um what is it called uh something of nines something of yeah what is it was that the groove note uh yes 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 Uh, what's the name of that uh uh man it's right there and i can't say it i know anyway what was funny about it is i called up joe and i heard it i heard it two or three times finally and i called up joe and i said man i've been hearing this record it's just incredible and joe goes i produced that kevin (laughs) oh okay (laughs) you thought you were gonna be like you gotta check this out joe yeah you gotta check this out man (laughs) so yeah i took my wife to the village vanguard and that's the only time I've ever got her to enjoy herself with jazz. Unfortunately, being in Arizona, we don't have the best jazz scene here. If I lived on one of the coasts, I think I might have a better chance of uh, getting her on board. But yeah, probably. That's true. Right now, it's been def- <laughs> It's been difficult. Let right. Me see. That's a good question. Kind of, we talked about this before the show. What jazz clubs do you like in LA? Well. Um... I think we were talking about this before we went live. Uh, the baked potato, which is in uh, 
Studio City uh, is is pretty darn good. It's, they've been there forever. Don Randy, jazz. Well, he's was one of the Wrecking Crew guys, keyboard player, but he's a jazz keyboard player too, and he uh, owns it. And uh, he he gets a lot of good jazz in there. Um, the other one that we liked that closed down was the Blue Whale down in downtown LA. That place was great. But uh, but there's a few new ones coming on. Uh, we went and saw Larry Golding's. Oh, at a new club, I can't think of the name of it now, but um, yeah, but yeah, it's it's not a huge jazz scene in LA. I mean, I guess if you're really on the inner circle, but um, but um, probably still New York is kind of the center of the. Yeah, one place we want to check out. We haven't been there yet. Um, uh, uh, John Clayton was was. Uh, or no, it was Jeff Hamilton was talking this up. It's called Bacchus uh, in uh, Pasadena, and apparently it's a jazz club, supper jazz supper club. And uh, he said it's it's some of the best food in Pasadena. So uh, we want to check that out. Well, I'm kind of envious just the fact that you can name more than one is <laughs> okay. <laughs> the fact that you are, you know, we've got some coming on, and there's this and there's that. We, unfortunately, in Phoenix, we have one, but that's. Okay. Better than nothing. Better we than had, none. We had a pretty legendary in the fifties. I it was called the Jazz Mill, and I you heard of that? Yeah, you would get a lot of guys. Coltrane. You would you would get these guys on their way to L.A. Uh -huh. It was always great as a stop. You know, back when these guys were doing this to make a living. You know, right? Look for places to stop along the way, and we had some pretty great places once upon a time, but no more, unfortunately. It could happen again. Yeah. I, you know, I hope so. I'm doing my little part here in Phoenix to introduce as many people to jazz as possible. And Well, uh, I, I feel, and, and I don't know quite where I'm getting this from. Maybe it's, you know, wishful thinking to some degree, but it seems like jazz is on some kind of an uptick right now, and particularly jazz on vinyl. I mean, when you look at how the, the tone poets and the classics are selling, I mean, they're they're in the... the uh, um, what do you call it? The Amazon listing, you know, yeah. like usually f four out of the 10 titles every week are, are tone poets or classics. I, and I think that's incredible. People have asked me about this many times and they're like, Mike, why do you think that is? I think the problem with jazz in general is throughout the late seventies and the early eighties without mentioning any names, but I think wiffle ball jazz, elevator jazz in general kind of tune people into what they thought jazz was smooth jazz smooth jazz yeah so yeah, i think yeah. when people think of jazz that's what they think of and then you'll put something on of a different era art blakey's Mona, and that did it for me oh yeah i love people that record that's, that's, that's my like, favorite blakey record that's my favorite jazz album actually of all time oh, wow. and that's the record that it's got me probably into in jazz. my top 10 yeah unbelievable and that and I was the same way when I was young. I thought smooth jazz was jazz. And then I was introduced to that and it just blew my mind. And well, I've, I've told this story before, but, you know, I was actually working with people like Freddie Hubbard and Donald Byrd in the mid 70s. And I wasn't even familiar with their early stuff. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know about it. And I didn't discover it until the early 80s, which was like five, six, seven years later. Yeah. And and then I became an instant fan, you know, and, you know, to me, the, I, th I think one of the things that, that scares some people away is they think, of you know, just sort of like wild saxophone playing, you know, and and they think that's jazz, you know, and it's like, well, it can be. But um, but there's a lot of really melodic, wonderful jazz records, you know, you can definitely create many different moods with a jazz oh, record, depending on. Well, well yeah. put. And, you know, with other genres, maybe a metal record, you're not going to create many moods with the steam. <laughs> there's only, there's there's only the one. one. There's yeah. the one mood. Exactly. But, you know, I mean, when I look at, at Horace Silver and, well, you know, Blakey, who you mentioned, and and uh, Herbie Hancock. I mean, talk about a guy who's reinvented himself over and over and over again. Look at Herbie Hancock's career. I mean, it's incredible. And... Uh, that's one of the things. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I, uh, I said to my wife, I'm like, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put jazz on. I'm gonna put Herbie Hancock on, and she's like, Don't do it. This was yesterday in the store on a Saturday. She's like, Don't do it. And I put on uh, Rocket. And she's like, I'm, <laughs> on jazz. 
Like it's yeah. that, was, that record was huge. Oh, it was a huge record. And she goes, yeah. okay, you can leave this. But well, you different- know, you, you should have followed it up with the Maiden Voyage, you know, or uh, one of those. Uh, maybe maybe she would have said, oh, this is nice. <laughs> yeah, she would have been hip to that. Although every now and then I can, Imperial Islands, I can sneak that on because of us three, their big hit with it. She's familiar with the. Uh, with that track so yeah no, I, like I, I love that record i could sneak that in but uh, i think one of the things too with jazz in general on vinyl is kind of like the kirsten record but a lot of those great rudy van gelder blue notes and a lot of those fantastically recorded records it brings you into the record more than an overproduced 48 track record will ever do and you can exactly. experience it in a way that you can't do it with other and i don't want to say it's just for audio files to listen to but it because it's not you know there are, are records that are there only to test your system with but i right. think a great jazz record you can kind of get a great musical record and you can kind of show off what's capable of a whether your system is great or you know it draws you you'll get that experience of having a band in your living room. That's why I did what I did, Mike. <laughs> and that is absolutely fantastic. And again, if you guys are just joining us, I am going to be distributing uh, Kevin Gray's coherent label worldwide. And that's kind of what the big announcement was. And, uh, trying to my hardest to get this into more local mom and pop record shops throughout the United States, as well as uh, the traditional places, me and others places that you've gotten it from the other big online retailers. But kind of, it reminds me of what we're talking about here. Records like this, I think do a fantastic service to the genre in general for Mm -hmm. the vinyl hobby. uh, This record ticks off the Kirsten's record ticks off all of those boxes. It sounds great. It's recorded. Great. It's mastered. Great. It brings people in. And I think it brings people into uh, vinyl in general. You know, people are not, I play that record on a Saturday. People aren't familiar with jazz or they're not, they'll listen to something like that. And they'll be like, well, this is really fantastic. What else do you have that's similar to this? And I love those mm-hmm. conversations are the greatest. And I've had them a thousand times. And it's the conversation at the store level I never get tired of having. Because when I can recommend my favorite jazz records to get people going, it's my favorite thing to do at the shop. And I look at this label, your label, as a tool to do that. You can get it's And it's new music. You know, It is something new. That's um, that's why we're doing it, man. That's well, why we're doing it. I hope to be able to put this in as many as many local record stores as possible for that exact reason. Because when mm-hmm. it's in the shop and it's playing, I promise you, you put this record on your turntable in the store, you put a couple copies in the bin. This record, the Kirsten record, it just sells itself. Yeah. It, it just does. And I know that from experience. That's and great it's to the, hear. And it's not the only record that does that, but yeah. there are records that are so musically good and sonically good. You put it's kind of like that scene from High Fidelity, and I joke about that with my wife or whoever's in the store. I'll put the Kirsten record on and be like, "We're going to sell some Kirsten records now," and you put it on, and sure enough, it just sells. It's just one of those records, you know. Well, let me let me give you a little feedback on something. I, I don't know if we discussed this or not at all, but I got a call from a guy named Charles Port, mm-hmm. who um, is the president of Linkwitz Loudspeakers. And okay. he just before the Expana show, um, he said, would you mind if I played this in the room at Expana? I said, no, you know, knock yourself out. And he said, well, I just I've been playing it over and over again and I just love it. So he called me up like two days after Expana. So I don't know if you ever got into the Linkwitz room, but he was playing it in heavy rotation. No, I didn't. And, and he said that um, it, it, he got the same response every time. People would say, wow, this sounds like live music, you know. Yeah. And then the other comment w- was he said, I would take the record off and put something on and I'd play like a lot one track. And the, and the people in the room would say, could you put that other record back on? Well, <laughs> and so that, that was really fun to hear, you know. That was my thinking from room to room to room. It's like, 
I thought to myself, you know, from manufacturers and reps, I thought to myself, from room to room, it was the same thought. It's like somebody needs to help these guys <laughs> for a record selection because I could think of so many records, and that was one of them. Like, you could really be knocking people off with what you're doing here if maybe we just took a different choice. But it was that was that was the record that just kept in mind. It's like, wow, you should put this on. And I, I appreciate that. Sonically, it just would knock people out. So I'm well, one thing that was a little disappointing was was they were playing it in the Linkwitz room down at the Hi-Fi show, the THE show in in uh, Costa Mesa a month ago. Uh, but because the the show kind of consi- uh, 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 coincided with the uh, making vinyl mm-hmm. seminar thing, uh, most of the vinyl dealers went to that. And then yeah. the, the, the hi-fi show started the next day and most of them didn't want to come all the way from Chicago to, to uh, LA. So, uh, or wherever it was, I can't remember. Was it Minneapolis? I can't remember where, where making vinyl was this year, but wherever it was, it was a jaunt to get out to LA. So um, nobody had it in downstairs, you know? No, so I was thinking, Oh, well, at least, you know, people will probably walk down and buy one. You know, they couldn't, they weren't there. Yeah. That's... Well, you're going to fix that. <laughs> I'm going to try my absolute hardest to fix that as best as possible. Yeah, it seems like there's a set amount of dealers that actually go. I, and I thought about this. There's kind of that set amount of dealers that go to the hi-fi shows. Uh, and they kind of travel with it. That's kind of their thing. Yeah, but at that show, they weren't there. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, n- the big three, none of them were there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Mm. That is, and, you know, I've talked about it uh you know, many, many times with different labels and different things. I would love, and people, you know, I get accused sometimes of being, well, you know, it's because you sell records, but I really want the best of the best records to be very accessible. And it's, Mm -hmm. it is good for not only my business, but it is good for the hobby. I don't want to ever have to live, at least in my lifetime, to where records and music is coming out, you know, it's coming out and it's not, vinyl is not an option. And that was the case for 20 years the 90s I know. The earliest and i want to do my part as best as possible to prevent that from happening and i think to do that it's just get high quality records in people's hand and you cannot unhear things you will never if you put that kirsten record on on a good system or a tone poet or a music matters title or the prestige stuff you did uh, for Chad, you put those records on, you will never be able to unhear that from your in your mind. Right. And there is no digital file on earth that you're going to listen to and have that same emotion. Yeah, it's just so, not as engaging. I agree. Yeah. So my philosophy is get as many of those high quality records in people's hands. Let them listen to it. One of the things I loved about this label that you did is you never once came at it like we're going to make a collector's item here i'm going to number them i'm going to limit them we're going to you know my whole idea was to get it out there for people to hear you know i just yeah you know that was my original thought wouldn't it be great if and and so you know i i can't see any reason for limiting that no it needs to be great music and great sounding music especially needs to be accessible because when you're people come into the store all the time and i i have this conversation with customers all the time we do sell hi-fi i sell anything from uh 150 dollars starter audio technica tables to twenty thousand dollar technics at one thousand or you know even higher priced uh kuzma tables you know the the gamut of what's out there right very frequently people come in and they're looking for lower than that. And I mean, I have that conversation with people all the time that unfortunately with vinyl, the cost of entry is a little higher, but this is what you get. And then I put that record on. So the fact that these should be accessible and they should, records should be great and sound great because people are paying up for them. They cost more and it is more of a process. So I think the reward to that should be the best possible sound you can get you have to pay more for your gear you're gonna have to pay more for your turntable versus you know listening to a pair of headphones but the reward is this this is what you get Mm -hmm. so great recorded good accessible it should be accessible that should be the trade-off you shouldn't have to 
I'm not a fan of sellouts in 20 seconds and then you got to hunt on the secondary market for something. And I'm glad yeah. that was never even a thought in your mind. Well, you know, when the word got out that I sold out the first press run in a week, uh, people started thinking, oh, it's out of print now. It's like, no, <laughs> it was a very temporary, you know, out of print. I, I don't ever want it to go out of print. I want it to always be available. Yeah. So um, it, it's been kind of a uh, scary game <laughs> trying to keep it going, you know, uh, pressing run to pressing run. But uh, so well, far, so good. The first time is always going to be a little difficult. And I think, oh, yeah, you've mentioned to me this has done better than you thought it was going to do. Absolutely. So there was a learning curve there. And hopefully that's a little bit more dialed in by the second, which it will be. Yeah. I mean, you're fixing distribution issues, you're fixing pressing quantity issues, you know, but the best thing was the core product was never a problem. So no. that was the one thing that could never have been fixed, but that came right. out perfectly. And, you know, the second release will come out initially in a much higher quantity than the cursed record did. So how many do you think I should press on Anthony's record when we, for first pressing run? So what was the first pressing of the Kirsten record? 1250. And it sold out in a week. No, I mean, I think at the bare, bare, bare minimum, the Anthony should be 5,000. Really? I think at the minimum. minimum. Well, you know, that's what Joe Harley's telling me. And that, you know, his number <laughs> that's at a significant outlay for jackets and record pressings. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm getting that feedback from people and you haven't even heard it yet. No. The people who have heard it have all said, oh man, you're going to have to press 5,000 to start on this. So, <laughs> because there is always something to be said about the, you know, especially now, you know, if we were doing something like this 15 years ago, the shelf life of things were a little bit longer. So yeah, that's that true. Initial, yeah. Now there's so many great records and you're making a lot of them, but cutting them anyways, there's so Thank many you. great records coming out every single week that that customer attention is kind of constantly being, you know, bounced from, release to release to release although we're getting a little bit of change in the industry things have changed from a couple of years ago yep as far as what people are buying but that all analog great sounding 33 rpm is not changed that's here to stay and people are looking for it but yeah it does it definitely helps to have a huge chunk of something going into it but you're right it's you know you are doing something at a very small level and it's, I get where you're coming from. It's a huge outlay. <laughs> it's a huge it. outlay and it's just, it's, you know, it's a little intimidating, you know, when you write checks that big, oh, but yeah. um, I, you know, it, it's funny because when we did the Victor Feldman uh, direct a disc in my pocket back in 1977, you know, that was distributed by Nautilus. So, I mean, we were in on the, on the jacket design and then we were done with it. You know, they, it was pressed by JVC in Japan and they did the ordering and they did everything, all the distribution, everything. We just got a check every month. Um, so I didn't really know what selling records was, but it was amazing. We only did we did a 5000 press run on that to start. This is 1977 directly yeah. this. And we did another press run of 5000 and Nautilus went out of business in the middle of that. And we never got paid for the basically the second 5000 run. But um or not all of it. I mean, we, we got some money for when it first got repressed, but um, not not the whole length of the record. Yeah. But anyway, I, you know, that was my only experience with selling a record, you know, so. That's, uh, that was just the one, right? The one in. Well, we did it. <laughs> that's another funny story. In 1982, I did a second one with Victor called Secret of the Andes, but that was on the Nautilus label. It wasn't on Coherent Sound which is what we call the label for the mm -hmm. first one. Um, and uh, they basically did an end run around us to get Victor, which kind of also ticked me off. But uh, yeah, I did master it for him. So this is actually a pretty good question. It kind of goes back to the other. What was what, what are we kind of at with pressing quantity with the Kirsten? I don't know if I really want to reveal okay. those numbers. I get um, yeah, but <laughs> it, it's very good, i got to say. And I kind of feel like the second one so internally you know what kirsten did i definitely feel without even hearing it i think the follow-up is going to be stronger and i think 
that's well, kind of the trend. You know, going. Kirsten was virtually unknown outside of L.A. She's yeah. a really well-known musician here in L.A., but outside of L.A., no. And uh, these guys are known internationally, so literally. You, you've got, I don't want to say anything against Kirsten, but you've got more of an international stars, right? So right. it's a bigger name record, but right. you also have the track record of what people can expect going into this. You know, right. There was an unknown in the beginning, uh, but I think that unknown has kind of been a race. So now I think there's more familiarity with it. And right. I think people are going to be definitely looking for the follow up for sure. Right. And I think right. it's, I think as a whole, I think guitar records do really, you know, guitar based records, jazz records are doing fantastically well. Mm -hmm. I can't keep a green grant green tone poet blue note classic in stock for years. They well, let me just say out. this grant grant green is, is Anthony's favorite blue note artist. So there you go. <laughs> you kind of hear a little bit of that in his playing. Um, I don't want to equate him with anybody, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, if, if you've heard the stuff, he, he has put out a bunch of solo records. You can, you can find a lot of tracks of his on uh, on on YouTube. Yeah, and, he does uh, have a pretty solid. That again, that's another thing too. As opposed to the first release, Anthony's got a big catalog of records. You can go. And he on has a following. Record. Yeah, he all has, of those guys do. That's the thing, you know. Has Jeff Hamilton has a huge following. Gerald, uh, John. I mean, they all do. So. Yeah, it's so there's just such gonna, a huge built in audience, you know, you're not breaking anybody per se. This is a big built in audience. Right. Right. But being that it's, you know, basically a vinyl only, it'll be digital down the road. But for its initial release, it's vinyl only. That kind of limits it a little bit. But, uh, you know, the audiophile community is really resounded nicely with this with Kirsten's record. You know, it's been amazing. Well, yeah, I kind of think about thinking about that. There is uh there's definitely a more need for vinyl records at, at turntables in people's homes. <laughs> Your comment brought that to my mind. It's like, yeah, there's not quite enough of them out there yet. Yeah. Well, it's, we'll change that. <laughs> it's uh, one record at a time, but I, I really truly feel like, you know, you're a little older than me, but the most fond memories of music was when I was young, buying records and listening to records and the last 20 years, but throughout the there was that 10 year period to where it was, there were no records and it was, yeah. And it was I, a it's, wasteland. It's almost like, I think about that in terms of my musical past. It's like those 10 years just didn't even exist. There's no fond memories. There's no, I, you know, they're picking up a record. I can look at it something. The, it was the MTV era. <laughs> it was, there was no attachment whatsoever to that era of my musical listening. That it's just, it's like it didn't even exist. Yeah. So, and I'm glad that is what is being picked up by people now when they're buying records now and listening to records and talking about, you know, that a great feeling to be able to have. You can't, you know what right. I'm talking about. Agreed. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Maybe we'll answer a couple of questions and then we'll wrap it up. I was going to try to keep it at an hour. Let's see another Angelo Kelly comment. Angelo, I'm sure he would be all on board. <laughs> <laughs> for these guys i don't think oh yeah well i the other problem is dealing with artists that are signed to another label exactly so I, I don't know about john's situation now um he might even be on blue note still i'm not sure but i don't think though that would ever be a situation where any of those guys would be being turned down by you though oh no <laughs> absolutely not yeah Let's see. Well, I'll tell you one thing that was fun. Now, th this could lead to a record. I don't know. But we were in New York. We were just seeing um, Tierney Sutton. And the piano player that was playing, you know, accompanying her was uh, 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 Tamir Handelman, who was part of the Jeff Hamilton trio. And so after the show, he was actually sitting at a table out front of, of uh, Smoke. And so I walked out and I just walked up and said, hey, you know, I used to see you and Jeff in the clubs way back in the 90s. And he said, oh, very cool, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I said, oh, and by the way, you might find it interesting. I just recorded a new album with Jeff on drums. And he goes, wait a minute. 
are you that guy with the studio in the valley? And I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is I'm talking to a guy in New York. You know? yeah. So he, he Jeff had already told him about it. You know, that was very cool. My wife was just grinning ear to ear. Yeah, that's uh, you know, he actually lives out here. He lives in Tarzana. He was just back in New York for that series of shows. And I think, you know, you probably get a lot of compliments, but I'm going to put one on the screen because it's true. Uh, the stuff that was done for Music Matters and now Tone Poet and Blue Note Classic is responsible for putting a huge amount of people into vinyl and into jazz. Oh, wow. That's that's great to hear. I, I, I really that firsthand and that I comment, really, really appreciate that. That comment definitely uh, says a lot. Well, this is a good question. This is actually from Carl. He's actually a local uh, rec record degenerate like myself. <laughs> well, that would make three of us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it depends. It depends a lot. When you're talking about Blue Notes, um, I we, we do two a day, um, mm -hmm. two titles, um, Joe and I. And I, I do the same for classics when I master the classics. Um, you know, it's about a three, four hour project to, to run it down because, you know, it's like Joe has said before too, we know the blue notes so well, <laughs> you know, we know Rudy's sound, we know the eras, we know how the sound changed a little bit here and there for this and that, you know, one of from Mono to stereo from Hackensack to Englewood Cliffs and, and so on. So, you know, I'm not trying to downplay it, but, uh, it, it, it's fairly simple to cut. I've, I've had some projects which are mostly like the multi-track things done back in the mid seventies. I can spend an all, an entire day or more, you know, mastering one of those titles, you know, an album that was recorded 24 track and mixed in three different studios and, you know, that kind of insanity, which was not uncommon in the mid seventies. Mm -hmm. What about something like the car, uh, the war's greatest hits. I know when you run into greatest hits, was that a little bit more complicated when you run into greatest hits? A little bit. I mean, I, I did that in one day and I don't, well, I probably didn't do any more than that because I had to tear down and put the other system back in when I finished. Mm -hmm. But um, that was a, that was a good, probably a five hour project doing that. Um, a lot of this but, comes from, I think if you're able to whittle down the time. I would imagine a great deal just because of experience you kind That's of true to some to some degree but you know what was so fun about that was that um i would come into this uh, you know I'd, I'd work thursday you know because i don't cut fridays because i don't want stuff to sit over the weekend so i would cut thursday and then thursday night before i went home i would swap out the tube and the solid state system because they're on opposite sides of the room and the lathe yeah. is fixed so i have to move the racks around and hook everything up you know unplug replug anyway and so i had done that and that afternoon that master tape for for war greatest hits had come mm -hmm. in and i went wow i remember that war stuff sounding pretty good and yeah. i threaded up the tape and i just played the last track and i went holy cow man <laughs> i'm keeping the tube system in and i'm cutting this on monday morning and just see how it goes and see what people say and uh when i say the tube system i do need to explain it was just the cutting amplifiers and, and the input electronics, it, the the console and the tape machine were my normal, so it wasn't the full tube system. It was it was the tube, you know, cutting package. Yeah. So your typical. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I I've been swapping them out, you know, yeah. on Thursdays and then experimenting, you know, through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, doing test cuts of stuff off of high res digital and whatever. So I thought, hmm. I'm just going to go ahead and cut this and not say anything to Rhino and not say anything to anybody and just mm -hmm. see how it comes out, see what people say, you know, and I got the test pressing back, which was pressed at Memphis. And I was just blown away. I was like, wow, <laughs> this does sound really good. It's kind of interesting because there was a point in time where record store day, they would release some interesting things, but I never really thought, but let me pay attention to this because this gold splatter greatest hits compilation might be <laughs> a great sounding record. So I kind of bypassed it. Bypassed those things. I think and a lot of people did. Yep. But the last couple of record store days, that's kind of gone away a little bit. You know, you did a Kenny Dorham. I think you cut that right. The mono cut Kenny Dorham. That was a record store day title. For you know, crap. Was that a crap? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, you did a Chet Baker title as mono. So yes. we're starting to some audio files, some sound conscious decisions come for Record Store Day. 
and that roar was a, a total. When I saw that, I'm, I went to the bin and I had about 20 copies of that record that came <laughs> smashed corners. And I put them in the bin at a discount. And they were there for like a year. Nobody was buying them. <laughs> yeah, right. And I went and I grabbed the record, cracked it open, and put it on the table. And I, I, I was just speechless. I'm like, oh, my God. And it was funny, too, because by the end of the day, they were all sold. So the word <laughs> kind of like percolated and people kept coming to the register. And I'm like, ah, you saw the interview. And that was my comment at the, oh, you saw the interview, huh? They were all <laughs> sold. I, I think I grabbed a couple copies because I wanted to put it in my demo room. I always like having a good hodgepodge of genres. and Sure. Yeah. And that a good sounding greatest hits is a great demo record. But sure. So your schedule then 400 records a year, nothing to sneeze at. But that's only being done as well on a four day work week. Monday that's through right. Thursday. That's right. Well, almost. Um, I sometimes go in and cut something that's not really audiophile on, mm -hmm. on a, a Sunday night you know, for shipping on Monday. Uh, Cause I just get so backlogged. It's crazy. And I'm, I'm going in on the stuff that's coming from digital files. I get those all loaded in over the weekend. So I don't have to deal with that during the week. So it seems like I'm still working about five, five full days and maybe a little bit more a, a week. So you just, the concept is there. You don't want the lacquer to sit. You want to ship it off quick. Oh, absolutely. It. Yeah. It, it's, it's not worth taking a chance, especially in the summer. I mean, geez. So, I mean, have you done tests between lacquers that sit versus three to say? A week oh, yeah, after? there's been there's been a lot of research done on that. And there's no question, you know, <laughs> literally the lacquer starts to degrade the moment it's cut. Yeah. But it doesn't start showing up immediately. But mm -hmm. uh, but what, what you lose is a little bit of extreme top end and a little bit of low level detail because, you know, the, the, the undulations kind of soften a little bit. You know, it's, it's like cutting through a hot knife with butter. You know, it, it kind of wants to go back to its original uncut shape. So, you know, I always say that if you can get them processed within 72 hours, you're probably fine. But uh, I, I try to do it in, in a day, you know, turn around because because I cut them, you know, say I'm, I cut it on Monday. They ship Monday night overnight and they're at the plant at 10 o'clock the next morning. Now, what do you do on something like a tone poet that's. Is that delivered by hand or is those are those? No, those, those actually are also ship FedEx, but they go yeah. first overnight. So those get there at eight o'clock in the morning and it's a premium price to get yeah. that delivery, but it's worth it. And and Joe even goes to the extent of letting Dorn Sauerbeer, the processing guy at RTI, know that they're coming and the whole the whole deal. So he's and ready for of, them. So this is kind of the template of how you're going to make the best record possible. So yeah, that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I'll, uh, one more question, and then we're done. And this is actually right. uh, by the waxed here. And that is, do you have any comments on the jackpot meters record? I think you mentioned this in a stream. Yeah, they just. Back. Yeah, actually, I, I misnamed them as the wipers once, which is another act that I had done for jackpot. Yeah, yeah I'm really excited about those. Those are pure analog. Um, they sounded great. I just got pressings on it from jackpot, and I haven't even had a chance to play them yet. I mean, they literally came. Friday and I've been pretty busy. Really? So uh, yeah, I'm excited. And also there's some Booker T titles um, and that stuff was great too. So yeah, good stuff. Good, good mid seventies funk, you know, or not funk, but well, soul, I guess you'd call it. Fantastic. So again, I'll just end on this for the local record stores, small stores, feel free, contact me. If you just want a couple of records to put in the shelf, I want to do my part as, you know, I understand where you guys are coming from as small stores. I want to get that in your bins to where, you know, you guys can have that for your customers. So feel free, email the store at orders at the and uh, I'll help you out with that. But thanks again, Kevin. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to this. It's going to be a definitely fun, fun project for me doing this. I really do appreciate yeah, great, it. Right? Great to have you on board. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate everything that you've done for the label and for the record. Well, we need to get you mastering more records, not shipping out pallets of records. <laughs> right. Well, well, it, just, well you know, it does give me more time for making records if I'm not having to ship them. It does. That works out better for everybody because the shipping is its own business in a, in a nutshell. It's I, uh, yeah. Believe me, now I know firsthand. <laughs> you know, and now you know not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Bye.